Good evening. Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everybody. My name is Katrin Förster, and I am ABB's International Key Account Manager for Architects. And it is for this reason that I'm standing here welcoming you tonight to this very special event about smart cities and smart buildings organized by Zaha Hadid Architects and the CTBUH in partnership with ABB in the headquarters of the REBA in London tonight. The title leading this event, Smart Cities, Smart Buildings, sort of still jumps out at us because using the idiom smart for buildings and even for cities is still widely discussed and not everybody is in agreement and happy with the wording. But I guess we have to accept that smartness today is used in a wider context than just referring to someone human being a smart cookie. Viviana Musketola from Zaha Hadid Architects kindly approached me last November and asked if he would be interested in supporting and financing the event tonight with her. Well, considering ABB's wide portfolio on smart technologies for a connected city in terms of electrification and controlled energy consumption, and considering the portfolio we offer on smart building automation solutions, to ensure a secure, a comfortable, a sustainable, and a healthier environment to residents in buildings, it definitely makes sense to support the event tonight. With my roughly 150,000 colleagues based in 100 countries around the globe, we literally are present just about everywhere where a new smart city or a new smart building is rising. Definitely, we are in the UK and we will stay. Please bear that in mind. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now ask Viviana Muscatola from Zaha Deed Architects, who is a smart cookie, by the way, <laughs> onto the stage to welcome you as well. Hello, Viviana. Thank you very much, Caroline, and thank you again for the great support in organizing those events. So I welcome, I second uh, Catherine in welcoming you all to this third event organized by Zahadid Architect with CDBH and in partnership with ABB. On the fifth anniversary of the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, the Council itself that is based in Chicago and all of the other uh, chapters around the world are organizing events focusing on the 50 forwards and 50 back. Many events will therefore uh, pivot around the significant advancement of uh, buildings and cities uh, in the past 50 years while looking at what the future of the next 50 will bring us. This evening event is mostly looking at the 50 forward and we are gonna try to give a meaning of what SMART is and moreover where SMART is leading us. SMART is not new. In 2017, uh, Sadiq Khan has um, set up the ambitious plan to make London the leading smart city. And a lot has been done since then. I think a good decade has been spent in trying to harvest technologies and um, find better way of designing our building in our cities. The basic definition of smart cities is a combination of technologies that allows um, authorities or others to interact with both communities and individuals. Smart cities are seen, seen as a possible uh, solution to a lot of our contemporary problems, whether climate change or growing urban cities and the pressure that this is putting on financing our own cities. Um, or even aging population. 
So there are three main concepts that I think the speakers will talk about today, and one is in regards to communication. The communication is not only between communities and individuals or authorities and individuals, but it's also about how a building talks with a city and how this interaction works. Um, there, are, um, there are a lot of advancements that are coming with the use of artificial intelligence that not only uh, somehow measure and, and uh, store data about ourselves, but it's also able to react to what we do and somehow learn from it. The other item that uh, Catherine has touched as well is the optimization of natural resources, whether water, energy, but also sharing facilities. So um, I hope that some of those topics will be touched also during the question and answer. Finally, it's enhancing the quality of life, and by that is a very broad term. We are looking at performances, we are looking at air quality, we are looking at availability of opportunities. As a designer, though, I'm not only interested in what the technology can do for us nowadays, or what it can do in the future, but how we can interact with this inter technology, how we can find way of better designing our building and our cities. So effectively, there is some sort of intangible metrics of da data exchange in the air, and we want to know how this can interact with the way we design building and cities. Communication is a big element, and again, Mm, there, there, there must be ways of having forms of city and building that better respond to this amount of information flowing around us. Tonight, designers, engineers, urban planners and experts of the field will present their ideas, but a lot will come also from you. I strongly encourage every one of you to be active participant to this event, we want to hear from you at the end uh, during the question and answer session. Now, it's a great honor for me to uh, call on stage Peter Murray that has kindly accepted to be our uh, chair of tonight's event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm Peter Murray. I'm uh, uh, chairman of New London Architecture, and uh, uh, as you heard, I shall be moderating uh, proceedings this evening. Um, and I guess probably almost everyone here uh, today works and lives uh, pretty smartly, but it's what we can do and how that can extend our potential that uh, we want to talk about tonight, I think. And uh, the NLA has for some time now published an annual review of tall buildings in London. Uh, we started uh, researching that in 2013 and we realised that, that City Hall, actually, although it was overseeing planning permissions for tall buildings, didn't have any way of bringing all the information together into uh, one uh, database. They didn't know the impact of one building on another, buildings in one borough, on another borough, um, and uh, so for ever since 2013, we, we've been pressing the mayor to become smarter. You've heard he has uh, plans to be smarter, but uh, we still have to see that actually happening. We uh, felt that what he needed was a three-dimensional uh, computer model of uh, the whole of central London into which developers and proposers of new buildings, particularly tall buildings, uh, could put their own digital models and you could start to see what the overall impact of new development would be, what the effect is. Particularly as um, we're about to publish our next uh, uh, review at the end of next month, beginning of, of March, and we'll it'll be interesting to see what the impact of Brexit has been on uh, starts of uh, new tall buildings because when we first uh, recorded the numbers, we had uh, around 230 uh, tall buildings in the pipeline or under construction in London. That grew last year to 500, so quite a, a, a steep curve, but uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that now uh, hesitates in the light of the uh, disastrous political situation we find ourselves in. But it was interesting that that investigation into how cities can actually use 
computer modeling uh, more widely led uh, uh, me to uh, Singapore and virtual Singapore where uh, almost the whole of Singapore has a, uh, a, a virtual twin uh, so that all sorts of uh, aspects of the city can be managed more smartly, both in terms of new development, uh, but even down to the fact that the uh, street management people know what types of trees there are in particular streets and uh, which week they're likely to drop their leaves so that they can send the right team at the right time to clean them up. But interestingly enough, and this is happening with uh, quite a lot of disruptive technologies these days, there is a reaction against it from uh, people who were disturbed at the amount of data which was being captured by the authorities and uh, uh, used in this way, and or at least they were not quite sure how it was all being used. And even in uh, Toronto at K K Keyside where Sidewalk Labs uh, and Google are building a new development, which will be a totally smart environment with uh, centralised identity management service, uh, changing use of spaces, we're organised smartly, uh, sensor-enabled recycling, and, of course, uh, smart cars. Even there, there has been great resistance to the collection of data uh, by Google, uh, which, and their economy really was based on the idea that they would be able to access information from uh, citizens and utilize it commercially, which would then provide a lot of the uh, elements in delivering a, a smarter city. And it, 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 I think it's very interesting, the protests, that how they will have to now, I think, uh, look again at their economic model. So uh, tonight we're going to uh, talk about uh, planning, but also build form, infrastructure, and how all these smart things create uh, a uh, better and uh, smarter environment and um, hopefully uh, improve people's experience of the city and of buildings. And uh, so we've got uh, uh, four excellent speakers this evening, and our first one is uh, David Nicol of ABB. David. Thank you, Peter. So, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's uh, David Nicol. I'm from ABB, from the Electrification Division. Um, electrification is everything from solar or substation to socket uh, and everything in between. Okay, we've got uh, many other divisions in ABB, but this is the, the one that I'm from, and this is the one I'm going to talk about today. So, on the topic of looking 50 years back and looking 50 years forward. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to talk about 50 years forward, but I think I can talk about maybe five, maybe 10, but certainly not 50 because we just, if we look back 50 years and how far we've actually come, no one would have actually believed where we would have been today compared to 50 years ago. So I'm sorry if I'll disappoint you in terms of 50 years forward, but I'll try my best. So, first of all, I want to talk about the mega trends which are affecting um, all of us. Uh, the global trends are developing our civilization, but they're posing unprecedented uh, challenges. We've got rapid population growth. We've got an energy revolution going on. We had centralized energy. Now we've got decentralized energy. Before, energy used to flow from generation, from the big uh, coal-fired power stations, gas-fired power stations, down to the, the point of consumption. We've got the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, everybody now wants things customized. They want it just in time, and they want traceability. They want drugs to know exactly where it comes from. They want their pint of milk to know exactly where it comes from, from what cow, from what field, from what farmer. Um, you know, but we also have people are aspiring to live uh, in a higher comfort, much more uh, prosperity, and also driving, this is also driving much uh, energy consumption. So we see energy demand increasing uh, by 2040, which is not quite 50 years, um, by 25% as it is today. This is the global consumption. But also we see a lot of environmental concerns. And our challenge as individuals, as companies, as corporations, as governments, 
is how do we use more electricity whilst consuming less of the earth? How can we do more with less? So this is exactly the whole topic about smart cities and about smart buildings. On this slide, it shows and highlights the layers of a city. We see the layers as being transportation, buildings, industry, and all the, also the infrastructure behind. In all these segments, ABB plays a role. In the daily activity, humans augment their abilities with tools and with, which all require external power. Electricity is expected to be in all these segments of human um, activity in the urban environment. So if we look at buildings and smart buildings where we live and, wh and where we, we work, they're getting smarter, they're increasing our comfort, safety and security. But also we want to decrease our energy bill through optimization and much more energy efficiency. Now I'm just going to give you a stat in the UK. There's, since 1994, there's 8 million more people who now live in the UK. And yet the energy consumption has gone down 1%. So in actual fact, we're doing a good job in energy efficiency, which is absolutely fantastic in terms of sustainability. But who would have thought 20 years ago that we would be able to be sitting in Spain controlling our heating at home? Who would have thought 20 years ago we could actually look at our CCTV camera and let in the USP postman? Who would have thought 20 years ago we could say, and sorry, excuse me, Alexa, turn on my lights 50% and can they be blue? Who would have thought we could have said, Google, can you please deliver me a pizza and I want it right now? These things are mind-blowing. And think about what's going to happen in the next 50 years with technology. Artificial intelligence, which we were talking about, this is also going to revolutionize what's happening. Now, of course, there's a lot of political, um, governmental changes that will need to be happening. We can see in China that they're actually uh, using artificial intelligence to map out people's faces in school, to see whether they're happy, to see whether they're learning, and actually then get messages to the teachers to actually change their tone, change their voice, and therefore it becomes completely interactive. We see in artificial intelligence in the future that we will have security cameras which will be looking at access control. People will be coming in, mapping the face. If you're happy, Maybe we'll put on some really happy music for you, change the lighting, change the mood of, of the building inside your apartment. Maybe you're coming to work on Monday morning and you're actually quite sad for some reason. I don't know why, because I'm always really happy coming to work on a Monday morning. But you move, move in, you change the mood of the lighting, you'll go into your own seat, you'll change your seat, change your lighting, change your, your desk to the right height. They'll also tell you, what, where you are, where you're sat, because nowadays most people don't have a desk, they've got a hot desk. And the biggest problem is trying to find your colleague in, in eight floors of a building. Anybody been there? Yeah? Well, that will change. Okay, transportation. Probably one of the biggest issues about transportation is the air quality. And what we want in the future, I don't know about you, I have, I have children and I have kids, and I want to make sure that they have a better future and that we, we save the planet and save the environment and that we can actually breathe in our cities. At the minute, the pollution in the cities is getting bad. The government are having to uh, introduce legislation. Some governments are taking this to extremes. I wouldn't say it's to extremes. But, from, for example, in Denmark in 2030, they're going to ban completely any polluting cars, polluting buses, any transportation which is uh, uh, using fossil fuels. So there's going to be an adoption of multimodal electrical mobility, which will ensure stability, uh, sorry, sustainability and health of our future generations. But we also see autonomous um, vehicles, okay? We're also sharing. I mean, okay, we've all seen Uber, which is here now. But, you know, the younger generation are actually taking less and less driving tests. Why? Because they're living in cities. You can't get your car parked anyway. But when you want a car, you want to order it straight away. 
and you wanted to be there because everybody wants everything instantaneous because we're living in a world of instantaneousness and we want a car but we only want it for one hour or we only want it for five minutes or we only want it for a day we want to order it we want it now and then we want to leave it so there's going to be new oh there's going to be new models which are more as a service model including autonomous cars car sharing but also we move into buildings actually uh, in terms of lighting or energy or whatever will be much more as a service okay in terms of um, automation and, and so this is industry you can see in the little red mark I can't see it on my, my screen here. It shows a love, by the way, I'm, I'm supposed to see the slides here, but I see a lovely picture of myself, which is really scaring me. But anyway, ah, oh, here we are. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, on this slide here, we're talking about uh, industry and automation. And in fact, um, ABB has just launched in China the first factory, which is robots making robots. It's like something out of a sci-fi film, you know? Actual robots making robots. You know, the future is that people want uh, everything now. 50 years ago, we had manufacturing here with the Industrial Revolution. Then we started offshoring because it was too expensive. We wanted cheap labor. Now we're starting to see some onshoring because people want everything now. They want it just in time, and they want everything customized. I want my Nike trainers. I want them in pink with laces. I want white stripes, and I want my name across them, and I want it tomorrow. This is what manufacturing has to do. They have to also go from design of the product right through to, to manufacturing very, very quickly. So, to make all this possible, we need smart infrastructure. We need communications and we need connectivity also between humans and equipment, but also between equipment and equipment. This is machine to machine, sometimes called artificial intelligence. There's a big argument about whether it's artificial intelligence or whether it's just machine to machine communications, but I'll leave that for another discussion. Um, what we're going to see, or what we believe we'll see, is much more intelligent, localized electrical installations. We'll see uh, the elasticity of the infrastructure growing and, uh, and shrinking with demand. Intelligent grid connections, which will provide our customers with choice about energy management. And digital solutions, which will enable deep understanding of performance and transparency. So, um, we want to ensure, um, when we look here, this is about the infrastructure and the power. There was a lot of arguments in the past about security of power, because we were basically importing a lot of... Um, fossil fuels from, from other countries. And now we want to have secure power locally. We want it to be safe and efficient. And we want to bring the power from the energy collection part, for example, the PV farm, to the consumption part, which is the, the, the energy on the building. But our scientists in ABB are creating uh, our, our technology which will allow and monitoring the energy flow in a smarter, safer, and more reliable way. We're working with consultants and architects um, and also many of the other supply chain on uh, building informational modeling, installations, inspects and maintenance, renovation, providing harmony between the interior and exterior of the building and the total cost of ownership. We also see that buildings will become not a cost just in the future. We see buildings becoming, moving from zero energy consumption to actually generating energy and actually generating cash for uh, the developer or the building owner. Because in the future, you'll be able to generate uh, energy and you'll also be able to sell energy both to the grid and also in electrical vehicle charging. So I just want to go in in a bit more detail into two scenarios. One's going to be the smart building and the other is going to be uh, distribution control, and then I'm going to end there, okay? So in terms of the, the smart building, when we look at the, the interior of the smart building, we see uh, integration of building automation uh, with, with uh, the cloud and connection. We also see that with, with spe speech recognition. We see uh, lighting and emergency lighting combining with sensors, cameras, communication uh, and, and, and speakers. Um, 
The building will basically be connected, connected to the cloud and we'll, we'll be able to gather lots of data analytics, more about people and protection, building management and maintenance. So today, in this scenario, is in a building, we can automate the blinds, we can turn the heating down and turn it up. There's many things we can do. But in the future, we see that the, the building is actually smart. It can, it can crowd manage, it can navigate people um, through a building. It can also um, decide from outside with sensors what the weather's like, what the temperature should be inside. And this will move away from people coming in and saying, this room's too cold. In actual fact, you'll be able to pre-book the room, you'll be able to set the temperature, and when you get there, it'll be set for your temperature. And it'll be self-learning. And it'll say, I know, David, you're normally coming, you prefer the room cold, so we'll chill it down to 20 degrees. And then we'll turn around and we'll say, I don't know, Catherine, you're coming. I want the room at 23 degrees, and it'll automatically go to 23 degrees, knowing that you're coming on that time and also through recognition. Uh, this is my last, my last slide. Yeah. So can I just have the one up, please, on um, uh, the distribution? Uh, so ju just very, very quickly, um, this is all about energy management. We see the intelligent coming back into the building, coming into the switch gear, allowing to take energy from the solar panels, deciding whether to switch between solar and grid, uh, and whether to um, ch charge up the electrical vehicles or whether to charge the battery. So using the solar panels, you can see here, sorry, this is actually calling the ABB service van, which went very quickly, but that's not so important. Um, but this is really about saying the building is intelligent. I don't need somebody to phone up and say, hey, my solar panel's not working. Hey, my light's not working. Um, basically, it'll, be, it'll call up um, the, the, the service people. So we're talking here about battery storage, which is the same as a city. In a city, at the same time, you're going to need generation, you're going to need, and they're going to be local. And if you're using renewables, you're going to need battery and battery storage. You're going to need that to come on at night and, and, and decharge through the day. So that is the end of my talk, but I just want to finish with saying that in ABB, uh, we believe in, in the cities of tomorrow where everyone everywhere has access to a better life. We believe that innovation and pioneering technology will drive progress to a better world of tomorrow. So let's write the future together. Thank you. So just for clarity, when I talk about the city during this presentation, I'm mainly talking about the city of London, which is just the tiny little square mile right in the very centre of the city. Uh, and I'm going to start with a provocation. We don't aim to be a smart city. Nowhere in our objectives does it say we want to be a smart city. What it says we want to be is a city with great opportunity. We're thriving, we're internationally competitive, where people can achieve their potential, where education is fantastic. We aim to be all of those things, and we want to harness smart technologies and smart design. It's not all about technology to help us achieve those aims. And I'll give you an example. We've just digitized our land charge searches, which is not a huge leap forward, but why did we do it? Not because we wanted it to be digital, but because people look at property from all over the world in the city, and whatever time of day it is where they are, they want an instantaneous response. They don't want to wait until Tuesday morning when Amanda comes into the office in London. So we're trying to achieve that. I think uh, Simon made up a new word of instantaneousness, which is quite hard to say, but I liked it a lot. Um, so the city was heavily bombed during World War II and post-war was rebuilt on a grand scale. The Barbican Centre celebrates its 50th birthday this year and represented a great shift in the planning policy of the time, which was to decentralise residents and relocate them to the suburbs. Barbican's ambition was for a residential quarter, complete with amenities and cultural facilities, worthy of its central location in a great city and, and I'm quoting here, to save city workers from the drudgery of an overcrowded commute. Hallelujah to that. 
So the scheme at the time delivered over 2,000 units in blocks, townhouses and three towers, which for a long time were the tallest residential towers in Europe at 126 metres. It had high-level walkways which separated pedestrians from traffic, many of which still exist today. And there's at least a 50% chance that the Barbican will still be there in 50 years' time. So when we talk about the future, all these great things will happen, but a lot of our buildings will still exist. When I was in China recently, I talked about a theory of healing cities. And the Barbican, at the time when it was built, was, was about that. It was about healing a part of London that had been really badly damaged. And much of what we do now in a really congested, busy, developed city is about healing. Um, I think that's a really nice term. There have been many, many triggers for change in the city since the war, over the last 50 years. <laughs> Someone's been at the wine. Um, there was the demise of the newspaper printing industry in Fleet Street, the Big Bang, the requirement for large dealing floors, the requirement to not have large dealing floors anymore, the expansion of the legal sector, the emergence of new types of occupier, particularly tech firms, and of course the co-working revolution. And it was the devastation caused by the IRA bombs of the 1990s that led to the development of the tall cluster of buildings in the city. Despite what's been said over the years, the inception of the eastern city cluster was neither planned nor coordinated. However, with the intensification of the cluster that will take place over the future years, that is no longer the case. Following that bombing, a proposal from Foster emerged for the Millennium Tower at 386 metres tall. The scheme was never built because of concerns from the aviation industry, and this remains a determination to this day in building heights. But this led to the proposal for the Gherkin at 180 metres tall, the first tall building in the city for 20 years. This development set the scene for what you find in the city all over now, the combination and the beautiful marriage of modern, fantastic architecture with amazing heritage buildings. So now, rather than just responding to disasters, we're planning ahead for future development. We use a really wide range of sophisticated models, and somebody said earlier, and this is really important to us, the next stage is to combine all those models together so they're truly working as a, a virtual twin. So we model the constraints imposed by air traffic, by views of St Paul's and the monument, and by listed buildings. We model wind, sunlight and daylight, pedestrian flows, traffic flows, city block permeability and flood risk, amongst other things. Our planning and building control teams include planners, transport planners, environmentalists, arboriculturalists, civil engineers, environmental health officers, fire specialists, surveyors and many more. But I'm really interested in the idea that of an intra-disciplinary team uh, and not everybody working separately. So, the eastern city cluster will go from this to this, and that is just with buildings already in the planning, already with planning consent, and many, many more in the pipeline. And what have we learned from all this extensive modelling? Well, a cluster of tall buildings is similar to a huddle of penguins. <laughs> the design of the outer buildings can help to mitigate and make a real benefit to the impact of many effects on the whole cluster. And what sort of things have changed over the last 50 years and going forward? Well, 20 years ago, if you talked to a developer about putting cycle parking inside their building, you would have had a real argument on your hands. Now, there are 30,000 cycle parking spaces inside the buildings in that tall buildings cluster. We now negotiate free public access to viewing galleries and roof gardens, and we demand permeability under and through new developments to increase the overall capacity for people, provide amenity for city workers, residents and visitors, and to socialise the buildings. We insist that wherever possible, ground floor uses are opened up for retail and food and beverage, so that we've got active frontages and interest for people walking. And buildings now, of course, 
you all design buildings for the well-being of the occupants. We don't want any more ant farms of the old days. The old buildings in Fleet Street, which were designed for the worker to go in in the morning, have everything met, all their requirements met within the building and come out in the evening. Nowadays, buildings, of course, are designed to be flexible, to manage water, energy and waste efficiently. So what else has changed? Nowadays, you're more likely to see the guy on the right than the guy on the left. We have to continually improve the offer in the city to attract the globally mobile, talented people. The businesses locate in the world where they think they can find the talent, and that's really important to us. And however smart we are with our modelling, our technology and our design, it's ultimately all about people. Smart technologies can also help us engage with our communities. So in the city, our community is the vast majority is workers who come into the city and then leave in the evening. It makes them quite difficult to engage with. And there's some amazing work going on. We're working with a firm called Built ID, developing consultation based on gaming theory to attract that kind of audience and make it really easy for them to, for us to consult with them and engage them. And changing consumer patterns and technology are also leading to some new challenges. So, for example, the ability to ring Google and order your pizza immediately or anything else you feel like having delivered is causing us problems with white van deliveries that are very inefficient and clogging up our streets. Uh, and, of course, disruption is, is often a good thing, but Uber-style taxis, we've now got hundreds of vehicles applying for trade. Not always very easy to manage. So the co-working revolution is here, of course, there are 400,000 square metres of co-working space in the city and continued demand for growth. The rise and rise of tech firms and the availability of Wi-Fi, 4G and soon 5G means that cafes, the public realm and absolutely anywhere else can now be workplaces. In fact, when we did some research last year with tech firms, they said, we don't really know why you call us tech firms because all firms are like this now, so we're just firms. Um, so taller buildings and higher densities increase demand for space at street level. This is a really critical issue for us in the city. There are over 500,000 people come into the city every day. There are going to be over 600,000 in the future. This shows you Bloomberg Place, and it's just one example of where redevelopment has allowed us to reopen a historic street that was previously built over to make more space for pedestrians, create more frontage capacity for retail, restaurants and cafes, and allow the public to really engage with this amazing building. Okay, so we know that office buildings are generally only in use 60% of the time. The situation is even more um, severe on our streets. They're incredibly congested for about four hours a day, and at some times of day, they're almost empty. So, big data is really going to help us. It's going to help building owners make better use of their buildings. It's going to help us manage our streets better. And it will also help us manage the overall supply of utilities, such as energy and water. We're installing lots of infrastructure in the city. So, we have free Wi-Fi. We have 4G infill programme. We're preparing for 5G, and we've installed a mesh canopy, which I find quite hard to visualise. I wish I had an amazing slide to show you. We've installed it to manage our streetlights in a really smart way, which will save us energy and be responsive to demand, but it can actually be applied in future to help us manage almost anything. Pedestrian flows, traffic flows, parking, drainage, uh, making sure we know when to empty bins or empty drains and noise. It can be used for virtually anything. So my final fact, looking into the future, over the last 25 years, 80% of the office stock in the city has been either redeveloped or completely refurbished. There will be more redevelopment and more refurbishment going forward. And we've sp found space through our modelling for a further 2 million square metres of office floor space in the city. And we're continually, every new development that comes forward, we're learning lessons. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for having me to all, uh, all the people that did invite me. Uh, 
Fortuitously, I'm almost halfway between David and Peter. I have Peter's glasses and David's haircut. So, and, and I also feel fully vindicated for not having slides today on the basis that I was never going to one-up David on his slide game. So I feel, I feel in a good place. So just to give a little bit of background, um, I'm only, uh, what, four months into my new role. And before that, I spent 20 years at Accenture. And whilst I was at Accenture, obviously a large technology and digital services company, I ran the city's practice, including all the smart city activities. So I came into my role in the engineering space on the back of almost 20 years working in this space, but from the technology side of the equation. Having moved across, one of the first things I was trying to think of was, well, what does this mean? Uh, moving across from a technology services industry into an engineering services industry. What will an engineering services company of the future look like in five or ten years? And on the journey that I'm going to take in the next stage of my career in the engineering side of the business, what will be the direction of travel and ultimately what will be the destination of travel for that type of business? And actually at the core of what we're going to be talking about today is exactly that question. So what I could do is cast back those 50 years and then cast forward maybe 10 and start to think, well, what is the common theme here? What are the types of technologies and theoretical developments that are in play now, have been in play for the last decade or two, and will be in in play for the next few decades? And what does that mean for us as an industry, and specifically for my company and the company that I'm working with, in terms of how we will help to service the industry going forwards. So that's what I'm going to be covering off. Now, if I cast myself back 50 years, let's say to, what, 1968 or so, the story, uh, one of the stories I remember learning about when I was looking at the city space in Accenture was about Rand Corporation. So in 1968, the Rand Corporation in America went into a contract with the city of New York to try and solve one of their intractable problems, which is how do we save money in the public services space, especially in the New York Fire Fire Department. And they kicked off a cybernetics program where they looked to simulate and model the uh, fire services that were being delivered in New York, create a systems model using systems theory, as it was best shown at the time, to model what the city of New York was like and how it would respond. And as a consequence, where best to locate fire departments, and more importantly, where to close down fire departments. And the cautionary tale there was that in the process of saving that money, they shut down a whole series of fire departments across New York, especially in the Bronx. And in the process of doing that, over the next decade, 600,000 people in greater New York were displaced due to fire over the following decade because there were not fire departments in the right places at the right time to be able to deal with the consequences of the actions that were taken. Now, the implication of that is, and the story, I guess the moral of that story is, be very careful of how much trust you put in simulation and how well can you simulate an urban environment with the prevailing technologies that you have at the time. Now, my premise would be a lot has changed in technology between 1968 and now. And actually, as we go forward over the next decade or two, a lot more is going to change in terms of technology and social theory. So I'm going to pick two areas of theoretical development that I think have been critical and will continue to be critical, and a few technologies that are going to converge with those social theories to reposition simulation for a golden era. I think the next 10 years or 15 years will be the golden era of simulation. And it will be an area where engineering companies will be at the forefront, working with other parties in that value chain to to deliver new services. So the the two areas that I'm particularly interested in are network theory and, and complexity theory. The two reasons I think they're particularly interesting is from a network theory perspective, it gives us the ability to do things like social network analysis, understanding quantitatively how ethnographic developments are occurring within a city and how demographic changes are occurring. But also, as Vivinia said earlier, how communication flows are changing within the city. Understanding how the network structure of communications are operating within a city 
allow us to better understand how buildings as positioned in the context of, uh, of a part of the city are going to impact on communication flow. And buildings in themselves will have an impact on the way that communication occurs both within the building and within the context in the city. So understanding how we progress network theory and how data and, and simulation, especially artificial intelligence, help, uh, help us to inform that is going to be key. And I'll come on to some of those technologies in a second. The second is complexity theory. And the reason I'm so interested in complexity theory is when you start looking at the city as a system of systems, what you realize is that deterministic modeling or network theory is not enough because cities, by definition, are complex structures. They are comp complex systems that interact in unusual ways and create odd behaviors. And the interaction between systems is going to be at the key of understanding how urban systems will develop and also understanding how emergent properties can be identified within those cities that then reflect on the way that we think about urban planning, master planning, and design, and then, in that context, how buildings fit into that master plan. So continued developments in the fields of network theory and complexity theory will be absolutely the heart of the research agenda that we'll be looking at, and we'll be looking at how technologies forward that and play into it. The key technologies, just to name a couple, 5G is obviously a very interesting network communications uh, it's technology that's going to be coming uh, more and more to the forefront over the next 10 years. What 5G will enable us to do is embed IoT technology at much lower cost and more pervasively across the city to collect data on how the city is performing and behaving and also how individuals are interacting with the urban environment. As we're able to collect more of that data at lower cost, it will feed into the simulation models that allow us to better understand and feed data into complex simulations, which then we'll be able to use artificial intelligence and deep learning algorithms to identify where trends are emerging across that and start to identify how uh, social structures are forming. So one of the things that we're particularly interested in, or I'm particularly interested in, is how you define the semiotics, so the structures, the social structures that sit behind the city, and how that then feeds into parametric modeling from a master planning and from a building perspective. At the moment, the way that we structure the parametric models tends to be much more focused on deterministic physical modeling. In the future, if we want to be much better at identifying and measuring how human behavior and how social interactions will interact with parametric design, we need to be able to better understand the underlying semiotics. So that's going to be an interesting area of development for us. So moving on, what does it mean for us as an industry? And what does that mean for Turens, the company that I'm leading at the moment, in terms of the way that we're thinking of going forward? And I'll, I'll probably pick up on three, uh, three topics that have really sprung to mind for us. One is... Over the next 10 to 15 years, interdisciplinarity in our industry is going to become much more important. One of the observations I had coming into this part of the industry was just how siloed the value chain is and the consulting chain is. With different engineering disciplines uh, sitting within multidisciplinary engineering companies, but never the twain shall meet. And I suspect that a big focus for us will be how do we break down those silos within a multidisciplinary entity and really focus not on being multidisciplinary but being on interdisciplinary, developing the core skills and capabilities across the organization that go beyond engineering into design, into technology, and ultimately into understanding value creation. And if we can create an organization that is interdisciplinary by default, Hopefully, that will make us more attractive to other participants uh, within the ecosystem that, that we operate in, both upstream with architects and downstream with contractors, to make sure that we can be active participants in the design program so that we can use our skills and capabilities, not just the engineering skills and disciplines and professional competence within the organization, but our ability to develop new simulation tools and capabilities and more rapidly iterate the design process and allow for uh, both developers, clients, contractors, architects, and engineers to participate in a joint design process. So 
being interdisciplinary will be right at the core of what we're trying to achieve. The, the second area is being, uh, treating technology as a core competency in our organization. We won't be able to get through the next 10 years or so without being really clearly focused on how we use underlying technology to drive competitive advantage. And as I see it, there are two simulation environments that ultimately we can work towards. One is better simulations of buildings themselves, creating digital twins, for want of a better word. But when we're thinking about developing building simulations, it's not building simulations for each individual discipline. It's building an integrated building simulation that allows facade engineers, architects, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, and MEP engineers to all operate in concert and to be able to iterate designs much more quickly to allow for uh, a, a better, more um, interactive design process. So we'll imagine that not only will we be able to simulate better using new technologies, more, co more powerful compute, better AI, better generative design, uh, but also being able to take uh, ex um, uh, uh, empirical data that we have collected over many, many years to feed back into those models to understand and improve the algorithms that we're using but then to effectively create better and better simulations. The second simulation environment will need to be at the urban scale. And at the moment, our ability to simulate urban scale is really limited. There are lots of 3D simulations of cities, but in very few cases are they able to in interpo interpolate the data and create different layers of data that interact with one another and be able to simulate complex interactions between those different data sets. And I think over the next five to ten years, increasing compute power, better use of artificial intelligence, especially deep learning, but also new platforms like Spatial OS, a great, a great UK company called Improbable.io, is developing an underlying platform that will allow much more complex simulation of the, at the urban scale and be able to deal with the, the compute, uh, computational complexity of that type of scale of simulation. So that will be right at the heart of the, 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 uh, the, the development pipeline for us on a technology side. The final thing I'll talk about is this focus on value. As I came into the industry and as I developed through the smart cities uh, agenda, what became painfully obvious was smart cities was really the emperor that had no clothes because it wasn't a technology problem and yet Within the industry, the technology companies were, were, were really driving the debate because they had the marketing firepower to be able to drive the discussion. It became a technology discussion. It was really a technology fetishism. And that really never resonated with clients. City clients didn't understand why we were talking about the technology or what the use cases for those technologies were. But fundamentally, at the heart of it, was a lack of an understanding of design why design was important to understand how to better solve problems, but more importantly, how we articulated value creation. Now, that lack of, uh, of a vocabulary around value creation in the industry is right at the heart of why we're not getting more resonance with developers around smart buildings and smart cities technologies, because we're selling them the technology and we're not telling them what the value proposition is for them. And frankly, they don't care what the technology is. What they care about is what problems does this help me to solve? So the mantra for our organization will be everything will be about value creation. That doesn't mean pounds, dollars, and cents. It, what it means is how we create value and articulate value in ways that clients understand. In some cases, that will be economic, but in many cases, it will be social and environmental. But what we need to be able to do is embed that within the DNA of the organization and the industry to say how decisions that we make from an engineering, from a design, from a technology perspective translate into added value for the customer and ultimately for the clients and for the citizens of the city. So a big part of the research agenda for us going forward and the innovation agenda will be creating a vocabulary that we can make common within our part of the industry to say, this is how decisions that we are making translate into outcomes for you as a client. 
And the hierarchy of need and the vocabulary will differ from client to client. When I'm dealing with an architect, I understand that their hierarchy of need and their value framework will look very different to a developer or to a city government. And therefore, we need to have a flexible framework for how we think about value. So we'll be thinking about how we bring together new disciplines, how we power it using technology, and then we, how we translate that into a value framework and start articulating value creation. So in a nutshell, that's uh, what we're going to be focused on, and hopefully that will position us in a place in 10 to 15 years' time where we'll be right at the forefront of the industry and hopefully working hand-in-hand -hand with everyone else in the industry. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening. Happy to be here. I'm taking the architect's perspective and that's actually connected up with what Simon was saying. It's about social processes and architecture's framing and ordering social processes. Um, and sets the purposes for which technology solutions then apply. So society's purposes and uh, aimed for congenial user experience, that's what we are about in terms of the architectural perspective. City is society, and that has been changing. There's been a radical historical shift from, the, from 50 years ago to now and into the future. And that has to do with technology as driver uh, as well, uh, in terms of the shift from uh, Fordism, Fordism, mass mechanical reproduction, stable over decades, starting in the 1920s all the way to the 70s, uh, meant suburbanization, meant uh, nine to five routines uh, from everybody, uh, homogenization of the population in terms of universal consumption centers. We're moving to kind of different arena where all the people who used to be locked into assembly lines, whether they're bureaucratic or mechanical, and are set free to become creatives to reprogram these robots which are now spinning out products and they could be reprogrammed weekly or services which are now uploaded onto apps uh, daily, if you like, and, and ready for billions around the world. And that means we all converge into the city and becoming this dynamic ecosystem of collaboration. So, and to generate that new level of prosperity and kind of the social cooperation is the prosperity engine, of course. City-wise, that means a kind of total transformation from this kind of industrial city to the post Fordist network society city and London is a key example here. This urban concentration and piling in and dynamism and, and complexity. And in terms of the individual buildings, we're moving from this kind of simple routine where you're nine to five and you know where you are to continuously evolving roaming space where you don't have a particular space and where also we have intelligence and artificial intelligence in the furniture in the future. Uh, but also urbanism means when it embeds and transforms, it can be adaptive, it can be coherent and self-differentiating. And I believe in this kind of more in, um, creative destruction rather than healing, but at the same time it is also continuous self-making and, and evolving. Um, and this is some of our urban master plans which are um, built on the idea of complexity dynamism and uh, uh, rejecting uh, routine repetition as well as, as this kind of random agglomeration we're seeing at the moment spontaneously happening. But what we like is, uh, this is the first kind of smart city style uh, economic cluster, instead of having uh, separation of workspaces from residential spaces and having fenced in car parked uh, blocks, uh, we have an urban fabric, densification and then even connecting uh, buildings on ground through pedestrian passages, through all buildings, as well as on multiple layers in bridges across. So for me, the theme of the buildings being part of a fabric, a woven network, uh, internally inter-aware with all the spaces communicating through atria and then from building to building through bridges is the way we're looking at this. And this could also go into multiple layers into the third dimension. So it's a three-dimensional weave we should get into. So that one layer on the ground is maybe no longer enough in the future. Uh, Hong Kong is an example where you had two layers already, but there could be, there could be more layers. And again, uh, some of our buildings will be opening up uh, rather than hiding everything floor against floor or even on the floor through a core, across levels, 
interaction, and then I looked at the ABB image of the office building. It was all separate cells, but we need to be inter-aware. We need to cooperate and communicate and be intervisible to, uh, to be part of thousands of people coming together, precisely co-locating, to cooperate. means they need to run into each other, meet each other, uh, uh, and, and, and develop uh, networks of communication and cooperation. These are the kind of visions of buildings we, we are offering and working on at the moment. A lot of them in Asia and China where you have more scope for radical innovation and more dynamism of growth. Uh, this is one of the buildings recently finished in, in Macau. So this kind of uh, exterior structure opens up that freedom of interior connecting throughout the building and there you, the, the elevator becomes a navigation and a three-dimensional vertical street in which you can uh, experience uh, what's going on, participate, connect up, and also at the same time remain visibly connected with, with, with other buildings around in the urban weave. Uh, that's what uh, my vision is, and I can imagine the, the, the exciting London cluster to, to, to have atrium bridges to be the next stage. We also make studies like this where we have uh, public event spaces, not only in the roof, that's great, interim, intermittent, to come down and, and meet and have again atria and these intermittent uh, green and public spaces. We're doing also these kind of, on an urban scale uh, cluster, we're trying to find district figure signatures uh, where multiple buildings cohere into something uh, configure in, in the real sense rather than being in a random agglomeration. A few literally smart city branded uh, projects around the world. We just wandered around in Moscow, the outskirts, uh, smart city. And uh, again, uh, the attempt to open up the block structure, have porosity, interaction. Some of these might become atria. And then um, also building up height, and you can see the terraces, the, the porosity, uh, and uh, this layeredness of a three dimensional city. And at the same time, trying to make it green, trying to make it harmonious and beautiful, uh, letting water in, letting green in and having residences coming through that. Um, yeah, that's uh, the beautiful site in Moscow. We won this and we're doing technology campus in Xi'an for Tencent. And you'll see here, look at the number of Chinese projects now, where they're kind of, at the moment the policy is to reject very high density and have more of a garden city, Stanford campus-like um, idea, but we're still having a layeredness and three-dimensional complexity in this. Uh, I think it's a mistake perhaps to spread out, but it's uh, something we, we work with. But you can try to see, we have, we're trying to have urbanity, layeredness, uh, um, deep vistas and transparency in this. And of course, there's technology is presumed uh, to be kind of dominant in this technology company campus. Uh, Wuhan, these are city expansions which are also premised on that new wave of service and R&D and finance and marketing based uh, knowledge economy which China is shifting away from and we already of course fully within from the manufacturing into R&D, uh, a project for Wuhan. We were thinking high density, we didn't get it because we are in this kind of low density par paradigm. Uh, so we didn't win this one but we won this one in Chengdu. This is actually called Unicorn, this is about a startup culture and Unicorn, the one in a million winning startups, uh, which are meant to be kind of uh, incubated in this space. Um, and again, uh, an attempt to have green gardens, campus feeling, but higher density than you have at Stanford campus. And again, in Qinghongdao, uh, um, um, an, uh, an hour and hour train ride from Beijing, uh, and you can see again this kind of idea of a green city with a lot of uh, in-between spaces and uh, types of residences, co-living, co-working, um, an, an interesting fabric. Um, this kind of paradigm is, is happening. and It's lovely, but maybe not dense enough. This is Chongqing. It's on the outskirts. It looks very, very uh, village-like, but, but urbanism is just the kind of, just out of the frame, hitting at it. But this piece of land, we again, is this kind of idea of a campus, very organic, very layered, uh, with, with all mixed uses coming in. Uh, this is actually lightweight manufacturing offices as well, of course, research development, uh, universities, as well as residences, and a very high level of uh, technology in investment. I just throw this in between, this kind of campus. We just won a competition for uh, Hong Kong University uh, campus. Similar concepts. 
And you can see the idea of making variety, of making it landscape-like, making it porous, open, interconnected, using the three-dimensionality to overlook and have elevational transparency in these. And, and the whole series, of course, of communication, to, because this is not where you come in and sit nine to five on your desk. This is where you roam around in the city making connections, meeting, meeting, meeting. So there needs to be a, a lot of pedestrian uh, a cycling and all these kind of uh, ways of communicating across um, uh, in this in this space. And just you could look at this building which is just finished. It's a research and development campus in in Riyadh as a fragment of that larger texture. And you can see here already that if you, you couldn't just keep repeating this, there needs to be a lot of variety and differentiation, but I said at the same time coherency and connectedness between the different aspects. And you see also the porosity and openness of this continuously flowing field uh, with a lot of outdoor spaces, atria, um, in, in different kinds of spaces, meeting spaces, libraries, courtyards. This is a kind of working texture for, for this kind of dynamic, complex interaction scenario we're trying to get at. But I think rather than having these kind of greenfield conditions, campus, I think we should again look at the big metropolis as the site for uh, the next wave of uh, personal network society and uh, inf infused with technology. So this is Manhattan, obviously, and there's an attempt of bringing the green perhaps into here and making that happen. So, of course, co-working, there's co-working revolution is very enormous, and that means that dynamism, where you don't know who's coming, you're booking your, uh, your, your table uh, uh, online, it's also happening in China. So, we've been working for Google, or have been made some sketches for them, because they are sitting here, and I think the New York Cop is in the end is a better version than the Palo Alto, because you're right in the center of Manhattan, and they're building up a whole technology cluster there. Uh, some of the sketches we've created, and I just want to show, end with a few images of uh, work we're doing, I've been doing with students at the ADRL, uh, where we're looking at Manhattan and looking at the uh, Google incubator space. And you can see what we're trying to do here is something very porous, very open, very integrated, uh, very urban, with interior urbanism, if you like, coming through. Um, so there's a complex internal landscape, simultaneity, layeredness, many different companies inter interacting, intersecting working together, and we start seeing these simulations. This is actually agent-based pragmatic semiology. We're actually doing and building for the first time crowds which are differentiated crowds, which are sensitive to sociological and semiologically encoded domains and subdomains, each embedding with their and triggering protocols of behavior. So each agent has multiple stacks of behavioral protocols which are triggered when they are um, entering a, a particular spaces. Uh, and reconfigure. So we have three or four, four actually models of that, and uh, you can see this kind of openness, the porosity, yet you have intimacy and conspicuous uh, domain making without walls in an open territory. And the next level of this is that a lot of these furnishings are actually themselves agent, AI agents with intelligence, with behaviors, with spontaneous behaviors and learning capacities. I don't have these animations here, but that's the next layer on a level of what we're working on. But the main point here is actually the crowd simulations, and I come to that, uh, a third one of these projects. These are the vistas and visions, and here the, some of these crowd simulation is happening. So these are agents which are autonomously acting and moving. They have rule sets, decision trees, uh, uh, so they have a decision uh, structure and a utility function which guides them and allows them to navigate, and some of the spaces then light up or, or open and close. And you can see wherever you are, you have, uh, you're surrounded by multiple actors and agents, simultaneous ongoings, which you are aware of. And um, yet you have, at the same time, defined spaces, intimate conditions, uh, a kind of temporary closure of a realm, of a unity, of interaction, of a social situation, uh, and then you move from one to the other in that, in that field of simultaneity. And I imagine that to be moving from building to building and be kind of choreographed and, as you said, managed through uh, the building itself, the way its facade acts, the way furniture moves, partitions open, light shifts and changes, inviting uh, uh, people in. And that's the next level of, of research we're now bringing. We can bring that all into the same game engine, uh, the human actors as well as the autonomous architectural actors. 
So that's the research uh, project, agent-based parametric semiology, uh, a kind of new level of smartness with respect to the architect's smartness. We are in charge of the social functionality and then the technical functionality, which takes care of the physical uh, soundness, safeness, uh, temperature, etc., is, is engineering business. Um, I think I leave you with that image. Thank you. To um, open a, a discussion about uh, Simon, who was talking about how astonished he was how siloized um, uh, our industry is when he uh, came to uh, work in it. Uh, but Patrick was talking about dynamic collaboration, I think, uh, and uh, there are interesting things happening in terms of skill sets. Of, I mean, you, you could say actually now that uh, you know, in, in, anyone over about 45 in architecture doesn't have a job anymore, really, because they can't use the technology. Um, but also, we are facing up to huge issues which are going to hit the UK business after Grenfell, how do we create that golden thread? How do we actually deliver buildings which uh, do their job? You know, and, and is this is technology one of the ways that is going to create that collaboration which will allow us to create better buildings? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely the case. The, I guess the point that I was making was what seemed deeply ironic was I'd heard about multidisciplinary engineering firms and I assumed that they were interdisciplinary and that they worked together. And the more I got to understand it, the more I realized that, you know, I think somebody told me within the first week of working there that some people call them multi-disappointment firms, right? So you, you go to a, an organization, you get a great outcome in one place, but you don't necessarily get a great outcome in all the disciplines because they don't generally talk to one another. And, and that really surprised me. And that's not because I came from an, an industry where there was a lot of collaboration, but it was more a case of, I would have thought that the design process, by definition, has to be more interdisciplinary for it to be effective. And yet, it seems that there were handoffs happening at every single stage of the value chain, from architects to geotechnical engineers, to structural engineers, to facade engineers, to the MEP engineers, to the construction companies, backwards, forwards. And it, it just seemed that, that surely the future of this has to be a much more interdisciplinary approach with much shorter cycles in the design process where design isn't the domain solely of the architect, but goes into the structural engineers. And you know, one of the things I was very impressed with AKT when I came in was they were clearly positioned themselves as a design-driven engineering company, but it seemed strange to me that that was an unusual premise. Uh, I would have thought that would have been the norm. So I think you know, the consequence of that is a feeling that design has to be integral to all the work that we do as engineers, whichever domain we're operating in, and we should have an equal seat at the table in the design process, and we should be able to enable that through the technology and tools and assets and skills that we have. So, Patrick, is, is technology driving that collaboration that you like? I mean, aren't, isn't it just technology delivering a quicker version of somebody drawing something on a piece of paper and passing it to somebody else? Um, not at all. I mean, the research project I'm talking about, I've indicated and hinted at, and, and, um, is something where we're just at the beginning, something you could absolutely not cope with uh, with pen and paper because we're talking, we, you know, architecture got away with um, not actually simulating or thematizing properly the social process because they were so routine and trivial uh, and stable that you, they were taken for granted and then you could focus on the build forms which house that, which you always already knew what is to be housed. Now in the contemporary condition, when you have uh, an urban texture, co-living, you have uh, detertalized uh, spaces, network uh, organizations, the dynamism and complexity, uh, what is going on, uh, and the scale at operations, we are utterly incompetent and agnostic as a discipline. 
you have a Google um, a campus with uh, uh, 15,000 people or just take the 1,000 people we had to put into a peer 57 across two levels. Where do you start knowing how, where to distribute 50 uh, meeting rooms um, uh, in one cluster at the entrances spread around uh, where these departments should be, should be placed and what this means with respect to the, the sole purpose of bringing people together in the first place, meaning that they have encounter chances across departments, across ranks with outsiders, in what constellations, and at the encounter is there a hook where they can make something happen. Um, we are absolutely agnostic, so in the simulations which, which Simon was talking about is exactly what we're working on, but the technology that is, makes it possible, there's computational power. But that's not the constraint. You can say technology is there, we're doing it, and there's a lot of false claims because I know once you start looking at it, what is the constraint is the science and the social theory and the intelligence of thinking through um, the uh, the problematics, the variables, the conditions, etc. That's where 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 where, where there is a, a lot of work, and it got to be interdisciplinary work. Um, and uh, that's what is a um, an interdisciplinary task. So you mentioned network theory and complexity theory. Sure, of course, yes. And space syntax actually brought network theory into the architectural domain with, and they operated on the space where there was nobody else, where we were utterly agnostic when it comes to the complexity of a city and understanding what opening or closing a street meant. And so that was a huge injection of intelligence, and that has been, they've, they've, this has been done and delivered. The next stage is, in this case, what we should look at is agent-based modeling, in particular agent-based computational sociology, for instance. Uh, economics, but also now interaction process in cities and in corporations. So, so we're just at the beginning of that. Uh, but that would then also, we need that because without understanding what the success criteria are, and there are social uh, uh, productivity criteria, uh, can we actually ha uh, know whether the technology is, is invested in the right places with the, with the right um, um, capacities. Yeah. So, Karen, the broader issues of how one brings various disciplines together, I mean, you're seeing presumably now that technology is, al is allowing you to engage more with those people who are delivering the change to the city um, in terms of architects, engineers, planners, using, and you can engage with their technology to tell you what the impact on the city is going to be. Um, yes, but there's a really important next stage to take, I think, which is that the development team and the architectural team will have all these experts working together creating something amazing. We'll have a matching set of experts and often we won't have their right expertise. We'll have to bring people in and consultants to check what you've said. And if we, if we could get to a space where actually we were collaborating at a much earlier stage, rather than us testing your homework, collaborating mm -hmm. all the way through to say this is the agreed environmental impact or social impact of this development, that would be, for me, the, the sort of icing on the cake in terms of collaboration. Mm. But I, I, I suppose the City of London, lucky being one of the wealthier local authorities in the country, I, th I think one of the problems that a lot of local authorities, don't need, they, even their computers won't actually work with most uh, uh, of the sort of systems we're talking about, so there's no, they, they can't actually deal with it physically, which is an issue. Well, and we're just hearing about the amazing advances that the industry is making, so a lot of local authorities might only have one type of application of that sort. It's really, really hard for them to gear up to deal with it because it might be a unique type of application that might never occur again in that area. So another form of collaboration would be for us to share skills across the country and say, well, if you've got something unique and interesting happening here, maybe there's something a bit similar that happened somewhere else in the country and we could share those skills a bit more. Thank you very much. And uh, David, so you, you've talked about uh, mobility as a service and uh, that are, are, you, are you seeing the take up in the sort of work that you're doing that um, you know, obviously there are lots of discussion about smart vehicles and so on, but are, do we, will we have the infrastructure to uh, deliver those? Do we actually even have the infrastructure to deliver uh, electricity to all these electric vehicles we're supposed to be uh, uh, using over the next few years. We've got the ULES coming in in a month's time in London and uh, in wider in central London, more widely uh, in 2021. So 
can we deliver all that sort of stuff? Uh, it's a saying? very easy answer. When you talk about the infrastructure of electrical vehicles, to answer the question, do we have the infrastructure now? The answer is no. Um, of course, there's been um, uh, you know, lots of talks. We've had uh, Theresa May up to Birmingham at the EV event. Um, we've had many, believe it or not, oil and gas companies looking at EV charging. Um, and there's also a lot of debate about slow charging, fast charging, medium charging, uh, because the, the oil and gas companies want fast charging and they want the infrastructure to be along the motorway so that you can stop in their service station, buy their food and groceries, which is where they make their revenue, and, um, and charge your car in five or ten minutes with a fast charger. And of course then the slow charging wants you to charge the car overnight at your home. But of course then there's a problem of, of um, how do you charge all your cars when you live in a 10 story, 20 story building? You can't drop a cable from outside down so you need um, smart car parks. You need to make sure when you get there that you've got a space to park your car which leads to this infrastructure of communications. When I arrive at home in my tar block, in my apartment, Will I have a space? Can I have a fast charger? Then there's the billing system. So again, there's this whole collaboration of a network which is required to put that infrastructure in place. Thanks. And uh, Viviana, so you, you set the programme for this evening. Is, is, is there, are there any sort of issues that you think our speakers haven't addressed which you are dying to hear some uh, answers to? Yes, thank you very much. Our presentation were very interesting. I think I have a question in regards what do you feel in all, in all the different disciplines is the major issue in bringing this uh, communication smart city and building to really be smart. Because apart from some of the very interesting uh, uh, case studies like Singapore where effectively it looks like they're almost there to make a, a city or a country smart, all of the other cities, they might have some, some hints of smart, but they are far away from achieving it. So which are the constraints that each one of you would see in achieving this goal? Right, yes. Quickly, each speaker, because we ought to just come to the audience if they've got any questions. So, Pantry, um, well, a couple of sentences. One, well, there are two constraints. One is political. We need much more degrees of freedom. Um, if you're talking about um, AI and a lot of simulation capacities and the build-up of complexity and so on. Um, we need to be a, we need to get rid of the rule books which predetermine everything and close that space before it's opened. Whether it's in terms of uh, office layouts and uh, space standards in the office in the in, in every other respect or. Or, so it's a bit like moving. The engineering disciplines move from the from the handbook and rules, where you have to select in a table the right solution, government approved, to a simulated, scientific, uh, verified uh, uh, responsibility. And that's where we also have to move with respect to what would otherwise be a planning rule book. Uh, so that's one constraint. The other constraint is maybe in, um, ideological, in terms of the uh, paranoia with respect to uh, data and data protection. I think there should be that. that if, if, for instance, that Toronto Smart uh, uh, City uh, Street Lab Google project falters on on um, a paranoia of, of residents, that would be a shame. Uh, so, for me, it, it boils down to the value equation. Uh, ultimately, smart technologies don't get implemented because the people with the power to buy them don't buy that they have a value proposition. Mm -hmm. I had a the head of smart campuses from a very large London developer come to the office not so long ago, and his, he said to me, I can't make a value proposition to the board about why we should allocate capital to a technology program when there's an alternative application of that capital to buying new buildings or investing it in the building itself. And the reason for that is I can't get advice on how to deliver that value proposition and articulate the value proposition. If I want to understand what it is, I have to go to a designer. And the design firms really don't understand that much about the industry. They may not know that much about the technologies themselves. I then have to go to a technology architect, who's a different consultant, to tell me how to construct the technology architecture. Then I need to go to a management consultant to tell me what the business model is in order to define it. 
And then I have to go to the building services engineers to work out how that's going to get implemented within a smart building. And all those four people won't talk to each other, and I can't get them from the same location. So it's all too difficult, and I give up. And how can you help me to solve that problem? And I think that is right at the crux of the issue. If we can't talk to clients, whether that's cities, whether it's building owners, and really clearly articulate the value proposition and how we're going to help get them from point A, they have a problem, to point B, they have a solution, then we're failing the industry. So, Carolyn? You, you, we're the old, oldest democracy in the world, and you are uh, one of the cities that, uh, or parts of the city which is really cutting edge. So, a couple of challenges for, from London's perspective. Compared to Singapore, what is our governance? With 33 different local governments in London and the GLA, apart from the local governments themselves, nobody else is remotely interested in where the boundaries between those things are, but it affects everything about how we can deliver in London. And the second thing is, is one of the fantastic things about London is that we have this really rich mixture of every type of development and architecture possible to have, but that means there's no easy solutions. We don't have any standardization or homogeneity about our, our building stock that would make it quick and easy to implement some of these solutions. Okay, I would say there's um, three things. First one is legislation, government legislation, which I described, which is happening in some countries like Denmark, who are clearly saying there'll be no uh, polluting vehicles in, in, in the city, for example. I think the other one is, is cost. Uh, you call it value, whatever way you look at it, the financial sums have to add up. The technology can be to a certain level, but if, if, if the sums aren't there, it's not gonna work. And also there's, there's, there's people who build buildings and design them and build them, but never operate them. So they don't really care after one year the total cost uh, of ownership of that building. And I think there has to be some change there in legislation because basically all they want to do is build the building with beautiful designs, but build it cheap in terms of construction. Um, and and, and the, the third thing is really the technology in terms of data because unfortunately there's a competitive environment out there. There's many technology companies who want their own proprietary uh, software, their own proprietary system, and they don't really want the, the, the data to be open, and it's structured and unstructured, and it's really difficult to bring it all together in one place. Thank you. Right, who'd like to ask our panel a question from the audience? Yes, gentleman at the back there. A microphone just coming to you, sir. Uh, this is for David. Um, just a quick question, the, the grid, the electricity now, people don't really think about it, but it's like air. We can't live without electricity. Could you imagine if you couldn't get your Facebook or your Instagram? Um, I grew up in New York City, as you can tell from my Yankee accent, and I saw in 1967 what happens when the grid goes down, and that was long before uh, internet. So what's to stop, wh how are they protecting the grid? What's to stop Vladimir Putin from having a little button on his desk and shutting down, basically, the whole grid, which would put us into complete chaos. So what, what protection measures are you working on? Um, <clears throat> so on the grid, just so you're aware, that's not my department in ABB, but I'll, I'll try and answer it. So obviously uh, the grid is, is, is changing. Um, the flow is changing. There's um, lots of new uh, automation, energy automation, distributed automation. And through that there, there's also a lot of risk in terms of, um, which is, by the way, another topic we never talked about, which is uh, cyber security, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. is also a fear. Um, but, you know, when you talked a lot about en energy specialists, I don't think we're ever going to get away from maybe a centralized energy distribution system. I think there'll be decentralized and centralized working in harmony with each other. Um, there's a lot of debates about whether renewable will be 100% or whether we're we'll always going to need some sort of uh, generation uh, aside. I, I don't know really what, whether I've answered your question in terms of grid protection or not. Uh, thanks. Uh, Russ Timpson from the uh, Tall Buildings Fire Safety Network. Um, question to the panel, building on that last question. Does, does SMART, does it mean more complexity? And if it means more complexity, 
the jeopardy with that in terms of resilience and where do we build resilience into the value chain because uh, I'm a veteran of Y2K, uh, I used to work for Virgin Atlantic um, and we all sat in the boardroom waiting for the planes to drop out of the sky. Um, we're talking about an order of magnitude more complexity here with interactions and the internet of everything. Um, and going forward, these cities will only succeed if they work and if we have continual failures and continual outages. And as a fire engineer, if we have the worst case scenario, which could be real problems, people shut in lifts and those kinds of things because technology doesn't work. How do we build resilience into this, in this, into this equation? The, the images I saw there were of, of amazing cities and I was blown away by those. I'm really excited about them. But as a fire engineer, I'm afraid I'm in the sort of real pragmatic end of this uh, and it's making those things work. So the question really is, if we're going to make the cities smarter and they're going to be more complex, is there a place for resilience? And with that, that means redundancy, it means testing and all those other things. I know they're not very sexy for architects, but uh, does, is, should it have a place and how do we do that? Simon? Well, maybe I'll just have a first cut at it. Uh, um, yes, absolutely. I think resilience is an absolutely critical design parameter. But for me, it is a design problem. And it's a, something that design can solve. I think the technology itself can be part of the solution as much as the problem, depending on the nature of the design you put in place. I think clearly mesh networks tend to be more resilient by default and therefore thinking about how you structure the underlying grid, not just from a cybersecurity perspective, but from a continuity perspective by having mesh redundancy into, into a system, especially can, if you're having... Can you explain for our less technical members of the audience about mesh redundancy? Yeah, so, so if you've got a mesh network, every, ob every device on the network communicates to a series of other devices that are connected on the mesh. So one node may have multiple node interconnections, therefore if one node goes down, it has redundancy already built in because it has access to the other nodes. So depending on the way that you design the underlying network system infrastructure that sits beneath it, you can design in the redundancy that's already in place. But you, it has to be an active choice in the design process. And that's why I'm saying it's a combination of the technology and the design that sits behind it. And that's why one of the things I was talking about is important is network simulation. Right? Network simulation enables redundancy because it allows you to understand where the critical nodes are on the network and how the nodes relate to one another. Anybody else want to address it? Yes, Carolyn. I... Um, thoroughly agree with that as about technology and design but one of the ways in which smart can help is that at the moment you, you all know that with building regulations the inspector is not obliged to keep any copy of the building regulations it's all down to the building owner the information could be in lots of different places lots of different hard to find um, there's probably no up-to-date overall picture for a building about the complexity of all the various uh, design changes along its life and one of the ways in which technology could help and, and building information systems could help is that you could have that uh, virtual twin of the building so at least you've got access to all the information about that building when you're making any decisions or any alterations or any changes you're doing it in the light of the whole and not just an isolated case thank you very much well i'm looking at the clock here and we are a bit over time and it, it, it says in a minute there are networking drinks so i wouldn't want to keep everyone uh, from from that and uh, we could talk about security for a long time because i was looking at all those big drones flying around uh, patrick's images there so uh, if that was near gatwick what would happen <laughs> then and have we got anything to deal with and i was actually not long ago at the uh, meeting of uh, senior security people in government and actually cyber security was the thing that they were all really worried about almost more than anything else in fact more than anything else and uh, so uh, uh, there are lots of issues which are probably beyond uh, uh, not sort of questions that maybe our speakers here can answer but it's definitely a, an issue which government is dealing with so um, fascinating series of uh, speakers across the spectrum of approaches to uh, uh, smart cities and I'd like you to thank them for their contribution uh, before I ask Javier to come up and speak to us so thank you very much indeed <laughs>
with us. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Council on Tall Buildings. I also wanted to thank ABB, of course, you know, for partnering for a second time with us, also in January, kind of the great start of the year. Um, I I'm also wanted to tell you, I also wanted to tell you about uh, what are the plans of the Council for this year. Um, at a global level, uh, if our colleagues in Chicago survive today, it's minus 43 in Chicago. I don't know if you've read the news. Uh, they are preparing a great conference first in St. Jean, it's the Innovation Conference. That's in April uh, with entries, uh, ideas, not only about design, uh, from the engineering side, from the smart city sign. Um, in, um, and this will be also the, the place where the council will uh, issue all their awards. And then the biggest conference probably in the history of the council uh, this fall in Chicago with this topic of 50 forward, uh, 50 back, um, including a big, big party um, kind of a relaunch of what happened in New York in the 1930s where everybody was dressed like a skyscraper. Um, I, I, I'm sure that if you if you read the news in New York, uh, you you recall that image. Um, so I hope you know that uh, you know as uh, as soon as you know about it, you can you can try to be there. Uh, on a more local level, here the chapter uh, in the UK and especially here in London, we will be predicting. I mean, inviting people like you know the ones the presenters that we had today. Uh, to think about the future of London uh, in 50 years, in five years, well, thinking forward, but also putting in value, you know, what has been done, you know, in, in the past years uh, with that kind of span, which is one century, 50 forward, 50 back, it's a very interesting one. Um, we will do brainstorming sessions um, in a hackathon format that we've done here bef uh, before in London and also in, in Manchester. Um, we have uh, uh, events uh, we will be focused more in uh, public realm and of course this issue of uh, uh, smart uh, space uh, will be there and well all of this will be you know uh, announced you know at a time one at a time and well I don't know Peter do you want to close should I close Viviana you want to close okay Okay, okay. Thank you very much. As, as Peter said, you know, drinks are there. Thank you very much for being here. And I hope to see you soon in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.